Flavor, family, dedication, tradition, home. This is what chili means to New Mexicans. You'll never see chili spelled C-H-I-L-I on any real New Mexican menu. New Mexicans spell chili with an E no matter what the dictionary says. This signifies a chili that is proudly unadulterated by meats, beans, and tomatoes. Chili means a lot to New Mexicans because they say you can't have enough chili. It's like chocolate. Women love chocolate. Well, we love chili here in New Mexico. Cultural lifestyle necessity. <laughs> it's just what New Mexico stands for. You hear New Mexico? Oh, chili. <laughs> chili to New Mexicans is a way of life um, from the moment it's planted till the moment it hits somebody's mouth. It goes through a whole process of, and it's a way of life. Chili is our culture. It's, our, it's what New Mexico is about. So it's like the, it's what everybody comes to New Mexico for. We're right next to Hatch and best chili in New Mexico. In, this country, I think. So yeah, here it's just a fact of life. I go, see, you go somewhere else, and like, why do you want to put yourself through pain eating hot chili? But I, I don't know. I, I think it's everything. It, uh, it's just tradition here. You know what I mean? That's just what it, what it is. <laughs> chili is to New Mexico what clam chowder is to Boston. What lobster is to the Maine. What deep dish pizza is to Chicago. It's a part of New Mexico's identity. Everyone loves it, but we don't go a day without it. There's never a moment where it's not in our fridge, on our kitchen table, or even in a snack, and even so much as candies. We live for chili, and we will die with chili in our hands. There's really nothing not to like about chili peppers. I mean, they have very, very little fat. They have no cholesterol because they're a, you know, a fruit um, in essence. They're very high in vitamin C when they're green, and then as chili peppers turn red, the vitamin C level drops and the vitamin A level goes way up. So they have a lot of healthy vitamins, and of course they provide roughage uh, for you and that sort of thing. In New Mexico, however, chili means much more than just the spelling. Across the state of New Mexico, chili is consumed at every meal and is celebrated in songs and at festivals. It's a $49 million industry. The official New Mexico state question is red or green, referring to the color of chili you want on your food. If you can't decide, say Christmas. You'll get both red and green on the same plate. Oh my gosh, red or green, they're both equally good. I mean, if you don't have a craving for one, you'll have a craving for the other. I like both. I just, I think it just depends on what day it is. And if I haven't had one for a little while, I'll try. I'm going to have to have it. So. My favorite thing about chili, um, depending on the day, you can choose a different color. And depending on your mood, you can pick it medium hot or hotter than that. Depends on the season. You know, right now the the green with a lot of red in it is is the way to go. This is where the flavor is at right now. I mean, this this mix of red and green, it's it's excellent. You know, with the chili culture, you're celebrating just uh, humanity. Uh, it it just any time, and it doesn't necessarily have to be chili, but any time you could get together and. Well, for us, New Mexicans, we get together, there's always going to be chili involved. So this is sort of like that. Chili's involved, then we're all getting together. Chili peppers came to New Mexico by the Spanish when they settled Santa Fe in about 1601, which means that they go back more than 400 years um, uh, in New Mexico. It was Juan de Oñate's expedition, um, I think arriving near Santa Fe in 1598, I believe, and they had chili pepper seeds with them. Why? because they regularly ate chili peppers in their cuisine in Mexico. So they brought those with them. As a matter of fact, they brought their own corn, even though the Indians were growing it. They brought their own corn, their own squash, the whole thing, plus chili peppers, which gave us a real start on having a fiery cuisine here in New Mexico before any of the other states in the Union.
The early history of New Mexican chili is actually has to do with the crossbreeding of two types of Mexican chili into what was defined as the first New Mexican chili. Uh, a man named Fabian Garcia, he was a, a chili researcher and, and agriculturalist. And he essentially made the first New Mexican chili, which was called New Mexican Number no. 9. This land right here goes back approximately eight generations in our family. Uh, the people that are directly north of us are my cousins, the people to the south of us are my cousins, and the people to the all the way up the chain were all related to us at one time. So. We've been raising chili on our farms since well, my grandfather started and then my dad took over after him and then now I'm taking over after my dad. So between us, we've been growing chili for over 70 years. I'd be 101, so we've been farming further back than that, you know because my dad, he started that first, you know. So it's, it's been grow, growing chili for ever since my dad come to this, this valley here, you know. Yeah. So it's way over 100 years anyhow. Despite Chile's place in New Mexicans' hearts and souls, the industry is facing a crisis that seriously threatens this important cultural tradition. I think is going to continue to decline in New Mexico because, number one, the, the labor situation is getting worse. It's hard to find labor. The rules and regulations are getting more stringent. The government's more policies. You can't spray this, you can't do that. And just generally, the expense, expenses are going up. Every year, the gunny sacks we buy, they go up. Every year, the fertilizer we go by. I bought a tank of phosphate the other day that did approximately eight acres of chili, and it was $1,500. That's just for one time, one shot of phosphate. That's not, that's not all of it. That's just one time to fertilize. So your expenses on chili are just going to keep growing, and... At what point is the consumer going to say, you know what, I can't, I can't pay that for chilies? But right now, the biggest uh, threats are overseas, China, Pakistan. They can grow chili, they can grow red chili, process it, and ship it to the U.S. cheaper than our farmers here in the valley can grow it themselves and process it at their plants. They can get it already packaged. Are Mexican chili growers putting new Mexican chili pepper growers out of business? Uh, if there could be a simple answer, it would be wonderful. But it's further complicated by the fact that a lot of the Mexican chili growers are in partnership with New Mexican companies to do it. In other words, they're growing under contract to New Mexico companies. And so it's a relationship there that is you know, too complicated to, to make a definitive answer to a, like a yes, no answer. Um, possibly, but they're, uh, the, possibly they're putting some New Mexico growers out of business, but they're putting some processors into business. So uh, financially, uh, the system is working. It's the Walmart syndrome. If it's cheap, it don't matter where it came from, they're gonna buy it. That's why we don't, we don't do that. I mean, we, we're a little mom and pop shop and we we uh we grow so much chili and we that's our product we sell three thousand sacks a year and and we sell them for a pretty good price but people are getting number one they're getting fresh chili it's grown on a family farm and it's guaranteed to be grown from hatch <music> We're in a precarious situation with the chili crops, particularly in northern New Mexico, because they are smaller farms and they're not as economically viable as uh, many of the farms you have in the south, which are large 
larger agribusiness operations. A kid who grows up in Chimayo or in Mbutho, and maybe their grandfather farmed and their father farmed, but when it comes down to this generation, they have to look at it from an economic standpoint. Is this going to be a viable living for me in the future? Um, is it going to be the lifestyle I want? Kids now, you, you, your obvious goal is to go to college. Many kids don't want to stay on the farm and, and farm. Here in Chumayo, the farms are getting smaller and smaller as families subdivide their land. And it doesn't allow for the big uh, mechanized methods of farming. And so the tradition is still doing it all by hand. We chose Chimayo Chile to do our first um, kind of preserve the native seed project was because uh, Chimayo is iconic within the, the northern New Mexico community. It has a 300 year history of being used as a, um, you know, being, being a crop that's grown um, specifically in Chimayo. Well, when I when they approached me about the project, they, they asked if they were, to, they were looking for a piece of uh, land where they could start the project. And I said, well, we had a piece of land here on the next to the shop. And uh, it was a, a, about a quarter acre that uh, my father used to plant before he passed on. And then it hadn't been used for maybe uh, three years. And uh, we went ahead and decided to go ahead and lend the project uh, the land so they could start the, the seed. Uh, well, that seed is just uh, two places you can let it go because that's uh, from Chimayo, and uh, you can tell right away when uh, Chimayo Chile is Chimayo Chile, instead of uh, Las Cruces or uh, Hatch or whatever, because Chimayo Chile don't grow that big, and it's tastier than anywhere else in the world. And back in 2005, we planted a, a, about a three quarters acre plot and um, we only had two buckets of seed that we got from one of the farmers that they dug out from out of their cellar. And we planted that two quarters of acre seed. And um, we, from that seed, we grew, we grew that quarter, three quarters acre specifically for the seed. And then we began distributing it. And over the last, um, I guess it'd be six years now, um, we, have distributed to over 63 farmers that are um, they're now growing in Chimayo, the native Chimayo chili seed. Because of the decline of chili grown in the state, farmers and researchers are looking for other solutions to help farmers grow more chili. Genetically modified genes are very aggressive and they, they, they like want to spread, 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 spread. The, there's a lot of issues around, you know, genetically modified seed because they can actually pollute or contaminate the other crops around them through cross-pollination and, you know, cross-pollinating, um, it can actually introduce those genes into your native crop. And that's one of the biggest concerns because it's not like you can, um, you can prevent it and that they could introduce this seed into nor, you know, New Mexico and that it could just wipe out in one season all the native seeds. Well, first of all, we have a lot of genetically modified cotton, corn, soybeans, and everything else. And they're, they're really not what they're bl blown up to be. And I don't think it would be good for the industry to have genetically modified chili. I really don't. I'm not for it. I'm against it. I think we should stick with our old original varieties of chili, work with them, try to improve them, or they make a better yield for the growers, where the growers can make more money at it, where they've got the real original flavors of the chili that, that the people are accustomed to, the, the New Mexicans are accustomed to. We love this business, but at the same time, we're in it to make a profit, and if we don't make a profit, we're going to go down. You know, we won't be farming no more. So, I mean, of course, you'd have to take a look at it. But it, it, on the other hand, it's the other argument is all these people. What are they going to do? And and I see both sides of it. It's hard. It's a hard road, no matter what you do. So, we'll see what happens.
it's a challenge because genetic engineering has helped the crops become much more economically viable, helped farmers grow better crops, grow crops that are going to withstand environmental factors a little bit, that are going to be a little bit hardier. Um, and so that helps to ensure that farmers are going to have a crop that survives through the harvest. Genetically altering it would be like uh, changing Bordeaux grapes by genetically uh, altering them to make your Bordeaux and, and so fine wines. I don't think it's going to happen. I think that we need to uh, subsidize if we have to. Um, so if we could do that with chili for something that people enjoy eating and that's such a big part of New Mexico's history, I think that would help a lot more than genetically altering for better crops. There is no such thing as a GMO chili pepper. There are GMO tomatoes, and almost all the soybeans grown now are GMO. You probably didn't know that. 85% of all the corn grown is GMO corn. But they haven't perfected the technique of GMOs in chilies, so all the people who are worrying about that, they don't have anything to worry about. I would prefer standard uh, selective breeding uh, rather than GMOs, but uh, they might be able to put some uh, resistance to frost into the chili peppers, um, which would help growers. There's all kinds of benefits to GMOs despite all the negativity that's been said about them. So it hasn't happened yet, but it could. If you can do whatever you want out there, then the consumer will, will decide yes, no, or, and everything. But what we need is 100% assurance that with whatever you do in your industry, that this seed is protected. In spite of these challenges, New Mexicans will never abandon Chile, their pride and identity. You have some of your highest end restaurants, very sophisticated types of cuisine, and you are seeing chili in fusion food. Um, so it's, it's been adapted, it's been adopted, it's been integrated. Um, it really is a, a very popular food. It's a, it's a cross-cultural food, really. Here at Pasquale's, we believe in making food completely from scratch. We don't bring in food from other places. We make it all ourselves. Um, all of our sauces, our chili rellenos are made in-house. Nothing is frozen here, nothing is tinned here. Um, it's about our hands. This is our culture, is about our making food with our own hands. You know, my favorite uh, chili dish is an enchilada, and, and, and the name itself is enchilada, means in chili. And I like the red chili enchilada. There's some kind of a chemistry between the yellow corn, not the blue corn, but the yellow corn, the cheese, and the chili. I don't know what it is, the flavor is just so magnificent. Roasting seals in the flavors, because so basically you're taking that skin and you're, the fire's hitting that skin and it's, it's roasting that skin and that skin separating from the meat, but it's injecting that fire roasted flavor. So it really draws the flavors out of the chili. <music> Chili memories, favorite chili memories. You know, it goes. It, when I think of chili memories, I go back to family memories, uh, and I, I can't separate the two uh, because I just remember so many days where it was the harvest time, and the family would get together, and we would go pick the chilies. And in, in in my younger days, it was Chimayo. We would uh, go north, and we would pick piñon, and we would also get the green chilies, and we would come home and roast them. And then we would uh, blister, blister roast them and do it on our grill or we didn't have the big cages back then and so we had to do it in the and on the grills and we'd have to poke holes in them so that they wouldn't pop on us. 
And, uh, and we always had a cutting board. Mom always had a cutting board, and Grandma always had a cutting board right next to it. Uh, and when we were roasting it, after we were done, before we would put the next batch in, she would be chopping it up with a little bit of fresh garlic and a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And she would put it on a fresh tortilla. So, so we always had the hot plate next to, to the chili roaster on the other side of it. So my, my memories of that is, is, is chili, just chili. And that's what we would just have the garlic, the little bit of salt on it, a little pepper, and on a fresh tortilla. My mother was still in her 80s. And uh, as soon as the chili would start coming off, she would make rianos right off the bat. We even... Uh, had a man up in Garfield make us a little small roaster that we could roast about five pounds of chili in so we could get started early over at Mama's. I've had a lot of favorite chili memories. I mean, I remember chasing the chickens out of the parking lot here in the, in the restaurant here in 19, probably in 1964 or so, 65. We were about three years old, four years old, and the pigs and so forth. So we, we grew up in a rural area here and we, my folks, uh, built this in 1962 and we've established where we are now and it's been 50 years in July that will be been open. We had an uncle, he loved hot chili as does my father and they used to sit together at the table often during family, family occasions, holidays, etc. or just every day and they would eat chili and they would sort of have these little chili competitions as to who could eat the hottest chili and they'd be eating the chili and they'd be, you know, sweat pouring down their brows and um, their tongues burning. And they would sit there and just enjoy it so much. They took such pleasure in this particular food. When I was nine years old, I wasn't very tall, so they sent all the kids into the attic to get the red chili in the baskets because the attic was really short, so the kids could just walk upright and do their work. So they sent us all in the attic to load the chili in the baskets so they could bring it out to take it to have it ground. I was loading chili for about an hour and a half and I had to go to the bathroom, but nobody told me to wash up. And in those days, my grandpa had an outhouse. So, you know, you had to go in the house to wash up. So I ran out to the outhouse. The next thing I know, I'm screaming my brains out and yelling for my mom. I didn't understand why I was on fire. <laughs> so now, with all that wisdom, I know better than to handle chili and then go to the bathroom. <laughs> People would have a bowl of chili every day. That was the old way in New Mexico. For breakfast or lunch or dinner, it's just so deep in the culture. <laughs>